uh, in that uh, cold morning of uh, 1986, Dick Rutan and uh, his wife, uh, also his co-pilot, took off from Edwards uh, Air Force Base in California in this very strange looking airplane. They embarked on a journey that no human beings have done before them. Fly around the Earth, non-stop, no refueling. There were hundreds of the people and uh, several dozens of uh, news media was, uh, witnessing this historical moment. I bet that most aviators and aviation enthusiasts remember that morning and that takeoff, of course. It's simply breathtaking. Well, 34 years later, in a beautiful May morning of 2020, I also took off from my home airport with my friends in this unassuming Cirrus uh, SR-22 single engine airport. No uh, spectators, no media, low profile, or shall we say no profile. We were just flying for fun. Everything was routine until we landed there. What a pleasant surprise. Uh, we landed there. Um, it's still COVID-19 time. We did not expect any restaurant to be open. Uh, guess what? This airport cafe is open, much to our surprise. Uh, but believe me, this is not the surprise I talked about earlier. It was about 2 p.m. The cafe was not busy. We looked around and uh, we find that the cafe has a central theme, Voyager's flight around the Earth in 1986. It has a huge war map and uh, quite some other uh, signed photos. We started chatting with uh, the waitress and who told us Dick Rutan lives nearby and uh, often drops in for lunch. Just as we were chatting about him, here enters the cafe, Dick Rutan. Dick entered the restaurant. Uh, the waitress introduced us. We invited him to sit down with us, and he did. And we sat there, we chatted quite some time, I would say probably 45 minutes. Uh, among all the things he talked about, uh, this is uh, what has really impressed me profoundly. He said, people look at the nine days, meaning the non-stop flight, my flight team on the ground. Look at every six hours, that's when they complete and send me the uh, flight plan for the next six hours phase. But I look at how I survive for the next five minutes. So no surprise. Um, his book came out later. It's entitled The Next Five Minutes. Of course, um, I ordered one and Dick signed for me. Well, enough of my talking. Let's take a look at the footages of that historical flight. 7.30 a.m. at Edwards Air Force Base. The December morning is cold and ice keeps forming on the wings. They have to be continually defrosted. The Voyager's designer, Bert Rutan, sits in his twin-engine Duchess with pilot Mike Melville. They will follow Voyager through takeoff and the first four hours of flight. At 8 a.m., Edwards Tower gives the all-clear. The takeoff roll begins. Takeoff speed is around 90 knots, and a speed of 100 knots is critical for Voyager to climb with the full fuel load. Gina Yeager calls off the speed and the distance covered down the runway. As the airplane started to move down the runway, I didn't know if it was controllable. I didn't know for sure whether it could get off in that much runway. Uh, I didn't know whether the landing gear would take the banging of the ruts and the concrete at that weight. At first, everything's fine, but then the fuel-laden wingtips begin to literally fly downwards and scrape on the runway surface.
There is confusion. Neither Dick nor Gina realize what is happening to the wingtips. No one had ever thought that, that it would drive itself down into the ground like it did. And it was terrifying watching the wings grind away, knowing there was fuel right at the wing tips almost. It was so frightening. And hearing Gina's voice come out, she was counting the 100 yards as they were going, and it was just this real steady, almost monotone voice. I, I was thinking to myself, how can she do this? You know, I mean, unbelievable. The thrill of seeing the wings finally lift and then finally bend and then lift off. Wow. <laughs> and then the magic hundred knots is reached. Hundred knots! Hot damn! We got out of knots! The fact that we were able to accelerate to a hundred knots told me as a performance engineer, got it made for performance. It was almost like I didn't think it could happen. But it, damn it, it happened. You know, got a hundred knots. Voyager is off the ground and climbing. Now it's time to assess the damage to the wingtips. The winglets, devices for increasing the efficiency of the wings, have been damaged. The undersurface of the wing has been ground away, revealing the foam underneath. Uh, the wingtip uh, wing uh, deflection looks about as predicted. Bert Rutan carefully examines the airplane and faces the decision of whether or not to abort the flight. The damage to both wingtips doesn't seem to have caused any fuel leaks or any vents to be blocked. But it's clear that the winglets themselves will come loose and cause drag. They will have to go. Somehow. Well, it's all there. Now, he'll probably lose it. Should we try to knock it off? Oh, we're on right now. The craft and the airplane will never go. This is our maximum speed. Let's get easily knock it off. The suggestion of knocking the winglets off is rejected. Bert's idea is to increase Voyager speed by 10 knots in the hope they'll be blown away. The right winglet starts to shake. But there's no need for any intervention. The problem is solved naturally. Again, they move in to look at the damage. The brake appears to have been relatively clean. There are some wires trailing, but as far as they can tell, there's no risk of an electrical short circuit, which is comforting given the amount of fuel Voyager is carrying. Mike feels that the wings are bent unevenly. They examine them closely. No rush at all, you got days. I think they're bent about the same, Mike. I really do. I think it's an illusion because your eye picks up the angle more than the deflection. Uh, the left no winglet is still hanging there, but it too is blown off without need for any other intervention. Got the camera back on, and we have lost, lost the left winglet. Bert devises some on-the-spot stability and control tests for Dick to carry out. The results indicate that Voyager is flying well. A joint decision is made that the flight should go ahead. Out over the Pacific, the time comes for Bert, Mike, and Sally to say goodbye to Dick and Gina. Hey, what I got here is a negative 
there was certainly something uh, to be said about I wonder when and what con in what conditions we will see these people again or even if we will. Uh, when we first started planning the Voyager flight four years before that, we thought we will spend the money somehow to chase it all the way around the world and keep an eye on them. It wasn't planned that we would turn them loose like that, uh, and it was emotional, no question about it. Uh, you know, we waved goodbye, and they waved. Uh, I guess the scariest thing for me is I turned back towards California and I couldn't see California. <laughs> I'd never float out in the ocean that far ever. <laughs> so I had to recheck the compass to make sure I could make it home. Yeah. <laughs> As Bert Rutan turned for home, behind him, heading out into the Pacific, were a man and a woman whose lives depended on the airplane he had designed to carry them both around the world. The Voyager volunteers, the press, and a watching nation had seen the extraordinary events of the takeoff. Family and friends were extremely worried about the safety of Dick and Gina in a damaged airplane. Life in Mojave went on as it did every day. But in a trailer parked outside Hangar 77, a round-the-clock vigil began. The Voyager volunteers, including experts on weather, engines, fuel, and satellite communication, settled down for a long period with no rest in which they'd give whatever help they could to get Dick Rutan and Gina Yeager safely around the world. Back out in the Pacific, Dick and Gina settled into the routine of the flight. Now that they were on their way, their major concern was weather. The Voyager was heavily loaded with fuel and would be for two or three days. Any turbulence they encountered at this point could break the airplane. The wingtips were another psychological factor they had to come to terms with. No matter how strongly Bert may say there was no problem, they looked bad and the airplane wasn't designed that way. We had gotten, as we flew out over the ocean, a data point, performance-wise, that told me that the wingtip damage was not critical. The airplane had performance still, so performance was not the, the issue. I would think uh, the crew fatigue concern was the major thing. Uh, and also structurally, if they got some turbulence and during the first day while it was very heavy, it could break the airplane. I had already seen it uh, just before we got to the coast go through some very light turbulence with the wings bent much more than I'd ever seen them bent. So our concern was would they even be able to make a radio call that could be heard if the airplane broke and, and, and understood, you know. Uh, so our concern was let's, we've got to keep communication as continuous as possible. When daylight came the next morning, Dick was still at the controls. He had been sitting in the seat for over 24 hours. The Voyager had a small side hand control like a fighter plane's on the right of the cockpit. As they flew further out across the Pacific, Dick was reluctant to give it up. The great difficulty was that Dick really felt like he was the only one who could fly the airplane. And particularly with it that heavy, he was very nervous of turning it over to Gina. And he didn't, I believe, for several days. And he, he literally 
wore himself to a frazzle and at one point the people in the trailer were trying to communicate to him that he needed to get out of the seat. The doctor, Dr. Judler, was trying to get him to go back and get some rest. And finally I, I went in there and just literally ordered him out of the seat and being his wingman, so to speak, he got up out of the seat and went back and rested. So that sort of started it, you know, that was after a couple of, I think it was about three days, literally. And the airplane was back light enough that it was flying well. And, and Gina did a good job. And I remember staying on the radio and talking to her for quite a long time as they were drifting along. And he was, he just went in instantly to sleep as soon as he lay down. And, uh, you know, having a guy like him, he just, uh, he's such a hard-nosed person, he wouldn't back off, you know. And if he hadn't have taken that rest, the this, this flight could not have been successful. The Voyager was highly dependent on satellites for communication and for weather information. It was heading toward the intertropical convergence zone near the equator, where the trade winds would push it along, saving fuel and increasing speed. The price for this assistance was the danger of tropical storms. Back in Mojave, weather expert Len Snellman was on constant alert to warn them of any problems. As the days droned by, radio communication with the trailer parked outside Hangar 77 became increasingly important. We spent a lot of time on the radio trying to talk them into doing the right things or trying to do what we thought were the right things and trying to provide them with weather that was meaningful. And it seemed so ridiculous. They were out on the other side of the Earth, the planet Earth, looking at the weather. And here we were looking at photographs and things and getting information from Len Snellman and the weather people and passing it on to them and you felt sort of ridiculous he was you know miles thousands of miles away telling them something they could see for themselves 